And yeah, today's topic for a uh, Serbian product community panel is going to be models of product development services. So as I'm sure you're aware of, uh, our market is still predominantly uh, service oriented. And one of the services that the companies are providing uh, to their clients nowadays is not just about software development. Uh, they are actually providing a service of product development as additional value, additional layer on top of software development. So this is kind of why we're here to try and take a look at those services, uh, different types of models that companies are using nowadays and kind of different, uh, different ways uh, that they actually organize around those services. Also, of course, the role of um, manager that is actually in charge of that, that type of service, the type of delivery. Uh, so today with us, we have several speakers that are gonna, going to be discussing this topic uh, from different points of view, from the points of view of their companies uh, uh, and themselves uh, within those roles. So would you please introduce yourselves? Nicolina, can you start, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Anna. Uh, well, hello, everybody. My name is Nicolina, and I am a principal product manager at Vega IT. I'm also part of a technical advisory team at Vega that's also called the Center of Excellence. And uh, yeah, I'm very passionate about helping businesses achieve their goals. So what I usually do, I define product strategies. I'm usually here to support them uh, when we move to the actual product development to coach them and guide them in order for them to achieve their goals. Um, I have an extensive experience in launching new products, increasing market share, um, improving customer satisfaction, and I'm also a trainer and coach at ProductWise. That's uh, Anna's um, training program for product management. Uh, yeah, and in uh, addition to my professional experience, I also have personal interests that keep me energized and engaged. I love to travel. I love to explore new cultures. Uh, I think they give me a unique perspective on how different people approach problem solving. And when I'm not working, you'll probably find me trying out new restaurants since I really love food. Even though if you ever meet me in person, you would never guess something like that because I'm really <laughs> skinny. But I do, I do really love food. So yeah, that's enough about me. Um, Katarina, do you want to go next? Yeah, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I'm also passionate about the food, but you can see that on me. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Joke aside, firstly, thank you from my side for, for attending this panel and for dedicating your afternoon time to listen about the experiences in, in product development services from four different sites together with our lovely panelists. And I hope you will have a um, very nice time with us and fruitful discussion overall. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Katarina Samarjic, lead project manager uh, from company Tulke, uh, but I'm also covering variety of roles depending on clients' needs. As a business analyst, proxy product owner, delivery lead, and a little bit um, um, uh, in digital business consulting area. Uh, before coming to Tsulke and to the IT service offering industry, um, uh, where I'm here for almost two and a half years, I have worked in a product development area um, where I have gathered a little bit different experience than uh, what we have at service industry nowadays. But this has helped me and uh, is still helping me to support our clients kind of putting myself in the shoes of a product uh, driven organization. Um, and yeah, that's that's in a nutshell. I wish you all enjoy today's panel and I'm forwarding the ball to my colleague Dunja. Thanks, Katarina. And uh, thank you, Anna, also for organizing. Welcome everyone to this panel. Uh, my name is Dunja. Um, I'm a colleague of, of Katarina. I joined Zulke about a year and a half ago as a delivery lead. Um, I have a track record in delivering uh, projects that are focused on digital product uh, creation or digital product innovation. And in general, I'm very passionate about uh, improving the ways of working by leveraging uh, the power of, of these digital tools that we have. 
Um, and yeah, today I look forward to sharing with all of you some of the models we use in Zulke and some of the best practices um, that we use with our clients to help them uh, build high quality digital products. So yeah, looking forward to it. Igor, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So hi everybody, I'm Igor from HTEC. Oh, I did a lot of stuff in HTEC, honestly. Because like we'd like to say, like it's uh, spending a year, it's like a dog years in Asia. So, so uh, I spent some time as a product manager, division head of product, which is something between, I guess, group PM or product lead, something something similar. And now I'm uh, also an engineering manager, which is uh, basically I'm leading teams that are executing delivery uh, as uh, my experience so in those these two years that i spent in HTC, i have executed led over so well most of relevant services that they provides within within their por portfolio and multi multiple projects right now i'm overseeing a couple of the products in delivery uh none are product development though but I did participate in a, in a in a cup in a couple of product development stunt stints stunts. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much all. I like to cycle, like to travel, read, I read a lot. So yeah, uh, is Dan around? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so hey everyone, my name is Dan. I'm a co-founder at Mauro Ventures, and I work as a freelance lead product manager mostly for the Berlin market, uh, as I've been living there for and working there for five years. And then with Corona, I moved back to Serbia. Uh, my background is usually uh, was usually in early stage startups. Uh, so I worked in early stage startups in uh, Spain and in Serbia. Then I had my own startup that failed. And then um, I always joke, what does a Serbian do? And they go broke, they go to Germany, which is not the case anymore. But for me, <laughs> as well, it was actually cool because it, there was a lot of startups in Germany. So I worked first for um, Haycar, which was, which was an incubation for Volkswagen. And then after that, I started consulting. So it's sort of happening, happened by itself. I got one client then another client and uh, another client. Um, and with that, I moved back to Serbia with the idea of yeah, providing product and design services for the German market. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so maybe just a, a couple of notes for, for everybody. Feel free to post the questions in the chat. We have some predefined questions that we're going to start with. Uh, but once we kind of shoot out all those, we're going to transfer into the chat and look at your questions and go through them. So this was really a nice intro. Thank you, everybody. Maybe just to also start us off, just for, for everybody to better, better understand your companies, um, to mention what are the services that your companies are actually offering. Uh, so maybe, Igor, can you start? Yeah, sure. So, so basically what we are offering, most, most of our, most of our uh, engagements are team augmentation, to be honest. Uh, we also do a lot of product development. So from uh, from the idea generation to MVP, post on, post MVPs. Uh, we also do discoveries as a standalone package that includes not just discovery as a the pro product side, the risking, but also the the, the technical side, architecture, uh, uh, solution architecture, etc. Uh, also, we are doing various various types of audits for for companies because we do them internally as well. So we offer them externally services, some stuff, some other stuff like like hypercare, like Alman uh, support, blah blah. blah. That's, that's that is a bit minor, I guess. Thanks. But product development, team augmentation are the key. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure who is also talking aside for yeah. yeah, we have a noise. Okay. Maybe Milica. Milica, can we mute her? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, at Vega IT, um, we offer a wide range of services and they're mostly related to software development or digital product or digital project discovery. 
like Igor mentioned, uh, when we do a product discovery, we don't do just the product discovery itself. We also do the architecture validation, feasibility part, and everything else. Uh, but mostly Vega specializes in software product development. So either for just building an MVP or supporting past MVP. We also have embedded software development. We have dedicated development teams. We have quality assurance services, DevOps services, data science, and many, many more. So as I said, a wide range of services that are related usually to the software development. Thanks. Maybe about Suke. Yeah, I can I can take that one. Uh, well, before moving to services, over you just a little glimpse about Tulke itself. Uh, we're Swiss origin uh, company, um, and we're a global innovation service provider, and we're spread over Europe and Asia, but with a global impact, because um, our clients are worldwide known companies, but we have also established something called global delivery centers in Serbia, Porto and Bulgaria, where my colleague uh, Dunja and, and I belong. But um, overall, what we as a service innovation company offer, it's actually capability selling, pretty similar to what, what HTEC is doing in that way. So we are actually um, building teams for our clients. Uh, then we uh, cover business and digital consulting. Uh, we're doing a classical service delivery and we also have this operating products and service offerings or so-called AMS services, application management services. Um, when it comes to capability selling, uh, sometimes we offer only Sulke team as a service. Sometimes we act um, as a one team together with a client because we believe that synergies and working uh, as a one team will have more benefits to our clients and our teams are consisted of software um, hardware engineers or embedded engineers quality engineers um, pms when i say pms i mean project managers in this in this regard uh, delivery leads who often uh, who quite often actually act as proxies to clients product owners because we are working with product companies or as a BAs as well, or even as requirements engineers, really having like that a deeper, deeper knowledge of the products we're working on. Um, when we do business and digital consulting, we're trying to create new value for our clients or new product or come even to a new service. When we do a classical service delivery, um, we manage like project managers or delivery leads, uh, requirements, compliance, risk, security, architecture. Uh, we're engineering the product, of course, and uh, sometimes we can even support manufacturing. And how we do that at Sulke, uh, we are following our, let's say, custom-made development model, which is um, made out of four or five, let's say, um, um, related, but can be also unrelated phases. And we call that agile delivery model. So we're usually starting with discovery. We can just sometimes sell only discovery. Then we're moving towards the alpha phase, which is usually prototyping of what we have discovered in the previous phase. Then we have a beta phase, which is pure development. And then we're moving to live phase, depending uh, on the product, on the client. It can be a very short period of time, or it can be more iterations or more versioning or more go lives. And after that, we're definitely having this future support or so-called application management service, where we really take care about um, live products, uh, where we provide service managers. We also provide um, engineers um, in collaboration also with some, some, some partners of, of, of Tulke. Um, um, when I was thinking, what can I also share with you that is also an interesting thing? and it was interesting stuff uh, for me uh, this year, is that we somehow uh, uh, know to recognize and offer a hidden services. And I can give you an example. For instance, I have started one project as a discovery. And um, client was totally, totally unresponsive, didn't want to share the details with us, nothing, because in their view, project was strictly confidential and we lost I think around two weeks uh, um, uh, you know doing a ping pong with a client and what happened uh, happened that um, client didn't know what 
you know, they wanted at that time when they did pre-sales part with, with our pre-sales bid team. And we kind of recognized and we turned around completely that project and team has changed over the night. So from discovery that we have initially started with, we turned out the project to be pure consultancy with C-level. When I say C-level, I mean CFO, CEO, and, and uh, that part of the team. And uh, at the end, we, we ended up working on a company ecosystem transformation. So these examples, I also like to call hidden services we, we, we offer um, at Tulk. Thank you for, the, for that example, yeah. Then maybe to kind of cover what type of services you offer as a freelance or within your company as well. Sure. So we are a bit of a more of a lean operation than I think other companies in here. So it's basically me and uh, two more co-founders that are sitting in Berlin. And uh, one of them is a tech lead. Another one has their, their own startup. Uh, and we sort of, because we are smaller and we cannot be, I think, competitive uh, on price and we don't want to do that. Uh, we're offering kind of two range of services. And one is a full-time staffing. And for that, we really search for like uh, early stage startups. So series C or series A, where the sales process lasts a long time. Sometimes they don't know what they need. Uh, sometimes they don't have an engineer on their team, or usually they do, but we will then find an engineering lead or a CTO to our personal connections in Berlin. And then we will see to staff them with full-time employees here in Serbia. Uh, and people will be directly integrated into the projects there. So it's kind of a cool chance for the startups there to find good engineering because it's kind of competitive in a big market and then also it's it's an opportunity for engineers here to work directly integrated in high, high growth startups uh, so there's kind of one set of services we offer so full-time staffing and the other one would be what i'm doing is freelance uh, product management um, and also ux design so i would find ux uh, design jobs that for example i could delegate here or i could work together with this on design with designers or I would jump in myself into companies where they need it. I think the market is very sort of volatile in Western Europe. As you all know, uh, people go on maternity leaves, people change jobs. It takes a long time to hire someone new. Oftentimes companies need an interim product manager to jump in and cover. Um, so that, that's kind of what we're doing as well. Um, but again, very lean operation, I think, compared to a uh, full case tech and uh, Vega IT. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. But that's kind of why you're here to show yeah. that there's a different model to uh, what the larger companies are doing. Uh, so yeah, maybe just to, to touch on the topic of what kind of models of collaboration you have with your clients, kind of what type of payments you're organizing with them, what, how you're actually working with them, you know, uh, just to understand what the setup in the relationship looks like. Uh, yeah, who wants to go first? I can, I can continue. Um, yeah. Sure. As, as a toolkit example. So when it comes to type of payments, um, probably like in every company here, we have this time and material and fixed price um, um, setup. Uh, time and material, yeah, simply said, how much you do, you, are, you, you, you need to, how much we do for you, you need to pay for. So our clients are charged for the um, actual work at specific early rates, um, actual cost of material, um, usage of equipment, and any other, let's say, um, expenses that are within the project. But also we have fixed prices where the client is charged um, on a negotiated price. Um, and um, this is independent out of the actual work and actual material cost. And we also have sometimes hybrid and combination depending which phase uh, we, we, we sell from our agile delivery model. Uh, when it comes to models of collaboration, we have two main models, let's say. We have managed team and we have dedicated teams. When we say managed team, this is really uh, a contract which defines a certain team for a certain period of time, but without a scope because scope will come uh, uh, during the delivery itself. And managed teams are based on time and material uh, uh, payment model. Um, when it comes to dedicated team, this is something that we also offer and where our teams are fully focused on building products with one client and in a long-term relationship, um, minimum for three years. And this is a little bit different. We have a setup fee, which is fixed. 
And then we have a monthly fee, uh, which is recurring depending how long and how many um, um, things we need to do with a client. So that's that's the main difference. But we also make some exceptions for some short-term assignments. Um, we usually sell them on a fixed price because it's easier. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Nicolina, come. Sure, I can go next. So at Vega, we have different models of collaboration, something similar that Tsuke has. So we have managed teams, we have dedicated development teams as well, or we have staff augmentations. Uh, in the dedicated development team module, we provide clients with a team of software engineers, designers, business analysts, product owners, co-engineers, DevOps engineers, project managers, etc. So whatever they need. And this team works together exclusively for that type of a product. And um, this model is ideal for clients who need ongoing development and support so this is something that's you know, longer term um, we when it comes to the payment we have just like in Sulke time and material and fixed price uh, when it comes to time and material usually we offer this model for you know when we have to create a product where the scope is not that clear there may be some changes we maybe have a continuous discovery set in place then we have time and material type of work and for the fixed price we offer them to clients where we know the, the scope you know this is a predefined work that needs to be done within some time frame and budget and that's when the fixed price comes in place when it comes to the payment models, we, uh, when it comes to the actual payment, we offer hourly rates, milestone based payments, and monthly retainers. But our goal is to provide, you know, the flexible and transparent collaboration and payment models that will meet the specific needs of our clients, and that will, of course, help them achieve their objectives. So apart from that, we have client uh, support managers who are there to define the type of collaboration and payment that you know works for our clients so yeah mm -hmm. thanks uh and do you want to go next maybe sure um i mean as we're smaller and we sort of uh, are still starting out we sort of are trying to avoid this usual thing that happens with software vendors where bigger companies will have three software vendors and sort of play them against each other and lower the price uh, which I think is often the case with like, I know I was working at eBay. This was the case over there. Um, and so the idea is to go for early stage startups where we staff full time, uh, where, you know, they don't even have maybe have time to check so many vendors. And it's more like a start, startup operators or self. We have longstanding like um, relationships with them. So there we would employ people full time and just take a really small fee sort of for the admin IT and HR services we provide. Uh, so we make some revenue there. And then on the, the consulting side, what we try to do with the design design consulting and product consulting is to go for this high value add uh, services. So like pro usually product and UX are, are one of some of those. Um, and there we, we just basically rate uh, an hourly fee. Uh, what I think is interesting is like, and what, what was still working in the market up until now is that we could get sort of Western European um, uh, hourly rates. So it's not this typical outsourcing in uh, Eastern Europe where you can save some money. Uh, but we, we actually are trying to present ourselves as, you know, as someone who's going to do as good of a work as anyone else in, in Western Europe. Um, so, and, but but the market is changing. So let's see how, how for how long we can keep that up. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Igor. Yeah, I think everybody mentioned everything. Yeah, <laughs> is that. there anything specific but, yeah. you can think uh, of that kind of is different within HTML? What we do with uh, fixed fixed bid, fixed price is uh, typically things that are easier to scope. So some so sort of product services, for example, or various audits or, or product discovery, system design, that, that kind of stuff that, that, we, that we know what's the start, what's the end. We had some experiences with RFPs and uh, multi-year projects that are fixed bids and that's very 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 hard to predict our experiences were weren't that, that that great there so we try to move that area more to, to time materials uh, we prefer uh, monthly we do hourly occasionally because some companies do hourly they don't do anything else and if you don't do hourly you don't work with them 
Uh, however, we do prefer monthly because it's much easier to negotiate. It's pretty much ends up with as the same cost, but it's much easier to pre uh, to predict uh, predict costs for, for for the client. So it's easier them to budget. Uh, what's also important one one very important thing for uh, product development because product development typically has it doesn't necessarily has an ending because there is like Nicolina mentioned, I think she mentioned uh, milestone based delivery. So we know that uh, when a client uh, came to us to to ask for ask for something for an MVP to be delivered, they typically have a budget for that. And if we pretend that we are doing time materials and we are working on whatever, uh, we can burn that budget very easily and then mess up the entire relationship. So we need to be aware, of, even though it's a time materials, we need to be aware of the limitations in order to, to optimize their budget. Because if we are uh, hired as experts, we need to be aware of the budget and we need to, to control, control the budget, even though we control basically how much we earn. But yeah, this, this is a necessary thing for if, if we want a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in some other areas, it's stuff, stuff augmentation, for example, it's it's a rate num times number of people, depending on capabilities. It happens that we switch between. It happens that on one same account, we have multiple things at the same time. Depending on, it's, everything depends on, 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 on the specific needs and specific needs at a specific moment, moment in time. For example, we can do a dedicated team, for for an MVP after the MVP, if if uh, if uh, they prove product market fit, they decide okay, their their in house team wants to take over. Then we do we do a switch. We can do staff augmentation. We continue staff augmentation. We can move to some other of the pivoting up opportunities, etc. So yeah, time materials typically, but a lot of variations of time materials. Hmm. Thanks. So maybe who are your typical clients or who are not your clients? <laughs> uh, how do you collaborate with them? Dunya, do you want to take this one? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as Katarina mentioned, we are primarily a consulting company. So we cover a broad range of topics across different industries. Uh, but of course, there are some industries that require our, our services more than others. Um, for example, our biggest industries currently are financial institutions and healthcare. Um, and then in terms of topics, we cover a lot of med tech, fintech, uh, IoT, because we have a big embedded team as well. Uh, and then also data and cloud migration projects across the different industries. And our client portfolio is broad as well, so we can go all the way, you know, from big uh, global banks, pharma conglomerates, to very small startup-like businesses uh, that are focused on innovation and then need our, let's say, know-how or expertise to help them speed up that innovation pace. Um, we do also a lot of uh, public sector work, especially in Switzerland, since the company is Swiss-based. Um, but maybe one interesting example, um, a recent one that we did was uh, the NHS, NHS Test and Trace mobile app uh, that our UK team did for the British government uh, during the, the pandemic uh, and the mobile app basically um, did test and, and trace tracking, so helped in theory save millions of lives during the pandemic. Um, there is, of course, also work that we don't do, um, the so-called uh, no-fly zones for us. Um, and this is usually work that in one form or another violates our, our code of conduct. Uh, so this can be, you know, everything from uh, no-fly clients like discriminatory or unethical organizations to no-fly projects. For example, we try to avoid military and gambling service uh, like industries um, and also no fly locations. So these are countries uh, with travel restrictions or something like that where we wouldn't want to send our teams uh, on the ground. Um, and 
The reason for this is basically that the company perceives that working uh, for some of these clients or projects could, could cause uh, unnecessary risk and maybe even reputational damage uh, for the employees as well. So yeah, that's mainly it. Thanks. Being good. Mm, yeah, we don't do gambling either. We don't do military either. We don't do gaming. Other than that, we are focused mostly on the US, Europe. Uh, now, type of companies that now, now that's where we really diverge. There, are, especially in the past, there were a lot of startups because when the VC money was cheap, there were a lot of startups and this pro development aspect where you have the entire stack and entire, capa entire capability stack, that was typically VC-based startups. So we either work directly with VCs and their portfolio companies, or we work with, with standalone companies, like I said, that are typically VC-funded. Uh, on the other side, we work with some big name Fortune 100 clients in tech, in various industries, but also we work and uh, with uh, some, I'm not sure how they're called, ag tech aggregators, company aggregators. I know those private equity firms that are typically very small, but who buy other companies in specific, in specific domains. So this is also one, one type of companies that, that we work with because they, they typically do work with, with vendors. This is the modus operandi. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much. Mm. Thanks. Dan? Yeah, I mean, sure, on our, on our side, we go for smaller clients. I think they don't go into the radar of bigger, bigger sort of software providers, right? Um, so for full-time staffing, it's usually Series C and Series A startups. And then for consulting is the startups that, are, that have more, a bit more cash on hand that can pay sort of those sort of rates. And those are Series B and Series C uh, startups in Germany and France mostly. Um, I had one consulting gig and it was exactly like that with five providers with, uh, you know, McKinsey in their BCG uh, and two more and sort of the big corporate was, was sort of giving a part of the project to each. And um, I think coming from an early, early stage startup world, we sort of like look for companies that look for that kind of experience. Because in my experience for the first time consulting that in that way, it's quite different from actually just launching a product, seeing if it works, validating it. Um, do you do you focus on any specific industry or not? So for now, we had for early stage startups, we had luck with legal tech for some reason. Uh, this, this is not something we planned, uh, but yeah. So we have a couple of legal tech clients. Uh, we have a startup studio that produces mobile apps, um, and then a couple of more clients in Germany that, are, that we're hiring for. Um, and then on the on the consulting side, it's mostly uh, marketplaces uh, that I've had fortune with, but also like fintechs. Um, also, like password management, Dashlane, um, clients like that. Um, Thanks. Nicolina? Yeah, at uh, Vega, we work with clients from various industries and of various sizes, so ranging from startups to large enterprises. Um, when it comes to industries, we typically work with health tech, insure tech, fintech, gaming, uh, Internet of Things, and many more, but usually fintech, insure tech, and health tech. Those are all top industries that we work with. And um, on the other hand, when it comes to the type of clients we don't work with, we have a sales pipeline and we have different parameters where we decide if we are a good fit for the client, but also vice versa. And that's how we decide if we shouldn't do a project with somebody. Uh, and yeah, we have um, clients all over the world. So America, Europe, Asia, um, Australia, we had a couple of projects for Africa, uh, we have offices in New York and Montenegro here in Serbia, so yeah, we're trying to spread in the world in order to support the growth and in order to support our clients as well. Yeah, thanks. So we took a look at uh, kind of what your business model is, who your clients are, and kind of what services you're providing to them. Uh, but who is actually managing the delivery of those services in your organization? Kind of what is the role of, of that person? Kind of how does that 
uh, service management look like, right? So do you want to just continue, Nicolina? Yeah, sure. Um, you ask who, who is managing the delivery or mm -hmm. the product development? Well, we're talking Both. about a service of product development, just overall service towards okay. your clients. So kind of on the level of service, who is responsible for that delivery? So everything well, that goes in that. Yeah. So when it comes to the first phase, so when we have a, you know, when we have a project where somebody wants to build a product from scratch and we, sh we do a product discovery, in that case, we have a product manager who fills in this role, who, you know, will do market research, who will define the product vision, strategy, product roadmap, etc. We also engage when we move to the phase where we have to, you know, do a project discovery and we have digital project managers and where we will, you know, define project plan and project roadmap and everything else that is needed we will uh, along so product manager and project manager will prioritize some things they will create some plans mitigation risks and everything else and once we move into the development phase uh, in that case we also have um, technically a responsible person for delivery um, and uh, project managers are usually the ones who do the change management and everything else so basically product and project manager and somebody from the technical side are our primary point of contact you know between the client and the team and we have to be there to provide regular updates on pro progress we have to work with clients to address any concerns or issues that may arise during whatever phase we're in uh, regarding that product. So yeah, that's typically who is involved here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Igor? Okay, I'll try to, 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 to just talk about the, the, the more, what we have most often. We mm -hmm. also did yeah. some, 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 uh, some aspects like dual track, continuous discovery, I think somebody mentioned yesterday or today on, on chat about uh, dual track. Uh, we did dub double in that and various levels of involvement. But uh, as for a regular standard product delivery, uh, typically uh, we have multiple <laughs> layers of of organization. So uh, I, as an engineering manager, I'm, I'm typically responsible for the relationship with the with the client. So our our sponsor, uh, various other stakeholders, uh, I am basically accountable and responsible for upselling, for for gener generating new work, etc. Uh, for for the delivery, uh, we have engineering leads who are typically leading delivery. Uh, some companies, I think, they, they use delivery leads. Our engineering leads are different uh, because they are uh, they have uh, engineering experience, so they act also as a technical lead. Sometimes, sometimes they also code. If, if the project is smaller, they they act as, as, a, as a developer or QA, whatever their background is. But yeah, they, they do have that, that set of capabilities other than uh, project management and general uh, the delivery leadership. Uh, and uh, when we do product delivery, we do have product managers. So uh, again, depending on the client, in startups, the people are typically a bit easier when it comes to uh, giving us responsibilities. So we do real, more real product management in other companies that are typically those aggregates. They don't really allow you to, 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 to have a much say in the roadmap, for example. But uh, for uh, for the in the moment, what's oh, sorry? Uh, yeah, I'm in the in the office. Uh, but yeah, for the for the for those those that kind of companies, uh, the, the, the aggregates, etc. You you do maximum you get is is product ownership. Uh, so product managers or product owners they are typically responsible for the scope but uh, they don't they have they tell you what's the next what's what's next thing to do uh, who's responsible for for delivery not product managers that's for engineering leads that's all always like that sometimes product people are on the client side sometimes not 
uh, sometimes when we have product owners that are working towards the team, in that case, uh, roadmaps and high level business decisions are done typically by, uh, by, uh, by the client. Sometimes in some cases uh, by the client stakeholder, our product person, and our engineering manager or engineering lead, depending on uh, on the how high level we are. That's basically, in a nutshell, product delivery, augmentation, and other stuff are much different. That's quite interesting. Okay, Katerina uh, Dunya, who wants to take yeah. this? Yeah, yeah, I can I can take that one just to make a, a comparison with with what Igor just said. We don't have product managers because we're a service uh, innovation company, but uh, what we do have are deliver leads. And even though Dunya and myself are actually product project managers, we're also taking this role as a delivery lead. And this is now a mandatory role, definitely, in our account leadership team. And what delivery lead actually does is to take care about the day-to-day -day operations of a project, to be responsible and accountable for successful delivery and for client satisfaction overall. And for the um, models that I have mentioned today um, for managed projects and for dedicated teams projects, I mean, those are contract type, right? Um, the delivery lead has to be a project manager, but for consulting projects or staff augmentation engagements, smaller ones, then delivery lead can be anyone who has the capabilities to, to perform these activities. It, it could be a tech lead or an architect or a senior um, engineer Year, so anyone or even business solution manager who is, let's say, responsible for the account. So delivery lead can be almost everyone, but depending for which type of, of, a, of a project or which model of collaboration we have. And what are the main, let's say, um, activities or responsibilities of our delivery leads? Um, as I said, to ensure day-to-day um, -day operations, staffing rotations to proactively shape the project context and try to strive together with the client towards the vision, um, to have a very good and trustful relationship with the clients, because if we don't have a trust, then the goals will not be achieved to that extent we, we want it to do with the client. Um, to ensure also the team satisfaction on another side, because delivery leads are always bridge between the, uh, the clients and, and, and the teams. Um, to be also responsible for growth of each team member on the toolkit side as well. Um, also to do a financial forecasting, to do a reporting, um, to evaluate performance also um, of the team members in that engagement. But also, as I said at the beginning, we're um, often proxying product owners because um, they're sometimes not capable to transfer what they need to the technical, uh, in a technical terms and technical level. That's why we're kind of also playing a bridge role here. Um, and we are definitely involved in requirements engineering work or in a business analyst um, area as well. Sometimes mixture and hybrid of all these things. But yes, delivery, delivery lead is, the, is, is our main, main role in managing um, services. Thanks. Dan, I know this is kind of not a typical question for you, but maybe just to uh, take a look at how you're actually managing uh, your contracts with your, with your clients. Sure. I mean, in terms of delivery, again, in, in our spirit of being a lean organization, mm -hmm. for early stage startups, we would expect sort of the co-founders to make uh, you know, hiring decisions as well as product decisions. So what we would do is we would pre-screen the people, recommend them, get them hired, and then expect sort of the, you know, the usually it's the tech lead or the tech co-founder that would be sort of managing that employee and managing the output and the deliveries. And then the more business uh, co-founder would be doing the product decisions. We saw that working quite well. I mean, the engineers need to have some experience uh, and we're sort of there if we're needed. We saw there were some problems where teams reached like overall startup reaches like 20, 30 people and co-founders need to start to delegate. 
uh, and they don't really know how to do. It. And then maybe we join in and we say, hey, maybe you need to hire your first product manager or, hey, maybe these responsibilities can go to marketing and not to gear. But we, we kind of look not to be responsible for the output. This is sort of on the client uh, for the full-time staffing. For the consulting part, uh, you know, I always joke, nobody needs a freelance product manager unless you really need one. So, uh, you know, you kind of come in and it's usually some sort of, a, you know, trouble going on. Uh, so I think like usually the product manager is responsible for the output or at least for the managing of the stakeholders. And then also, you know, it depends, um, you know, you need to have a good understanding of the client capabilities. You might come into a company and the expectations are hyper high. So you need to sort of like manage that or they don't have a staff design team. So you need to sort of explain that, understand what their hiring need plans are um, for, for, for the whole team and sort of manage the client in that way. So it, it almost... Um, you know, as Igor said, you know, and good product managers don't talk about timelines. Uh, that's up to engineering leads and to the estimations they do. But I think also when you're doing this kind of product consulting at one point, you also need to start sort of talking about their product strategy, team staffing strategy, um, available budgets uh, in order to be managed, to be able to manage the stakeholders. Um, but yeah, so... Um, yeah, that, that kind of brings me to my next question, which I, I'd like you to answer first, because I think it's going to be interesting. So how do you actually measure the success of the service that you provided? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, if you're just, uh, you know, if you're just jumping in for someone on a maternity leave, uh, you know, usually, usually what they want, they, to do. <laughs> they, 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 they want to hire you for full time. So that's how I know I did a good job or um, okay. at eBay, my contract got prolonged from four months to 13 months, uh, which was quite cool to do such a long freelancing product because also as a PM, you want to kind of follow up on some things and see them go live. Uh, but then also, you, you know, usually you do have this product ownership, right? So I think we do have regular retros. You can see kind of the, the the mood of your team and how they're feeling and working with you. You get your quarterly reviews from your boss. And, you know, most importantly, you see how the product is performing. I think, as you know, if you want to get continue getting recommended and continue getting your gigs, you sort of need to justify your early, early stage startup experience. And you usually do that by like doing the most like sort of common sense, uh, you know, first principles that you would do in any other company. Uh, but it's important that you drive some results, I would say, on the product itself. Mm. Um, and that way, you know, client is satisfied, you feel good about yourself, you know, and you actually probably, you know, did some benefit for the end users if the, if the numbers are getting better. Yeah, thanks. Nicolina, same question. Yeah, something similar to what Dan said. Um, so customer satisfaction, number one, and you also want to see that the product is going well on the market because that means that you succeeded in some way, right? So... Um, you, I know that at Vega, we measure quality of a service. So we have, as I said, customer success management set in place. So they're the ones who usually, you know, make sure that the client is getting what they need, that we're there to support their growth. I know that we also tra track uh, net promoter score. Uh, we track uh, if our employees are proactive, are they innovative, are they added, some added value, those sorts of things. Um Time to market is also tracked when we have when we want to support our clients to go to the market as fast as possible, um, without sacrificing quality of performance, uh, referrals, repeated business. These are all sort of indicators where you know that you're doing a good job. So yeah, that's about it. Thanks, Dunya. Do you want to take this one, maybe? Yeah, I mean, um, definitely for us. So our end customer is our client. So. Uh, as long as we are aligned with our clients on what a successful project or product is, that's what we, let's say, track our, our success off of. So a quote unquote successful project for us could be, you know, um, we deliver the project within the agreed upon timeline, within agreed upon budget, and we deliver the, the agreed scope. Uh, and that sometimes, uh, you know, basically means that we're not tracking the end end user satisfaction. So for example, we could deliver a feature of a product uh, that the end end customer is not happy with, but our clients asked for it and that's what what we delivered. So as long as we are aligned with with the client on what it is that they want uh, and we're delivering that, um, 
we consider the project or a phase uh, a success. So that is a continuous, let's say, communication. And that is, of course, not to say that we don't care about the end end user. Of course, we do. Um, we are, after all, a consulting company. So oftentimes, you know, we we advise our clients on you know certain things like for example don't go with this technical approach because ultimately end users maybe uh, do not prefer this technology or it's not the best best option for for this product um, but ultimately it's always that uh, balance uh, and the client needs to decide on you know where do they want to invest the time effort budget uh, quality etc for their and customers uh, to to have a high quality product. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ibra. Uh, well, uh, like Lena mentioned, definitely repeat basis. So if somebody likes what we are doing, it typically means that uh, that uh, we will get new business. Even though it can happen that they love what how, what you do, but they don't have money, or or they don't like what you do, but they, they're stuck with you. It happens. But typically, typically, repeat business is a big indicator. Another big indicator is uh, is a customer satisfaction survey that we ask a couple of, on a couple of uh, different points and topics. We survey all key stakeholders on the client side. Uh, that includes the MPS, even though there is some research that say that MPS in B two B is a vanity metric. But okay, we do MPS as well. Uh, other than that, we do have some const constant communication with the client, even uh, of, of, officially through QBRs, steering committees, whatever you call them, or uh, or just unofficially by 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 talking to them, and they can tell you if they're not happy with 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 the work we are doing or not. Uh, what product people love is uh, outcome based del delivery. We don't do that. We never, never, never do that uh, because one of the big reasons is uh, if we are going to be outcome based and we need to own the entire stack and that is not just pro delivery, but it also includes marketing sales uh, and all all the other all the other aspects are not in 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 our control. So it's not really fair to be uh, based on outcomes. Uh, however, we sometimes include some performance metrics that are relevant to certain teams or certain uh, certain accounts. Yeah. So Thanks. there are various various metrics. So yeah, CSAT is the the, 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 the key one that we aggregate. Hmm. Cool. I just wanted to remind our participants: uh, feel free to ask the questions in the chat. We have a couple of more to go through, but we're kind of getting closer to the end. So feel free to uh, ask um, our uh, panelists whatever's in your mind. Yeah, so maybe we talked about kind of different uh, services and approaches and uh, most of you mentioned kind of long-term engagements, not just uh, short-term. So I was wondering how do you define the milestones for those long-term engagements? Uh, Igor, do you want to maybe go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, depends. It depends. I mean, uh, it happens in some cases. I think even even in some projects that in some accounts that, that that we currently do that we are trying to push some milestones that client doesn't care. Careful. It's just they don't they, they don't care. Uh, in some other areas, clients definitely do care about certain milestones and certain dates, and that that. That's how how we define we define them together. Some other cases they hire us to do something by that date because, for example, the company before us failed to do it. So in that case, milestone is not influenced by us at all. We say yes, we can do that by that time, or no, we cannot. If we can and we do, that's a really good job. We are get repeat business easily. But uh, milestones, uh, there's also a level of complexity of milestones. And uh, typically, we do have some light milestones around the MVP releases in when we do a pro delivery of MVPs. So 
Well, you know when the, that version one is going to be released to the to the market, and that's that's a big date. What the scope that is going to be within that milestone that is always debatable and it's all always changes. That's how software works. There are of course some other areas, uh, for example, in RFP space that I mentioned before that we don't do it a lot, but in some places where we did. Uh, you have very specific set of milestones that are defined and linked to the to the contract. So you get the milestone. That means you will get the money for for, for the next. Uh, and yeah, that's that's very 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 rare. Another milestone is of course uh, uh, one big milestone. For example, in discovery that we do discovery service. And then for that you have, uh, for example, that that we know we decide on a roadmap, we decide on a on a work breakdown structure, etc. So so those are some more typical milestones of productized service that we know. Okay, this lasts for eight weeks, and we'll do by the week two we're gonna do this, by the week four we're gonna do that, by week six we're gonna do that, and there you have some light miles milestones that are that are basically part of the process. In the in the development, it's varies. Hmm. Thanks, Nicolina. Yeah, pretty similar to the H tag. So pretty much the same when it comes to discovery phase. We also have like a predefined milestones depending on the type of discovery that we are doing. That usually the end result is a proposal document that contains for both architecture uh, proposal and also a product proposal. And yeah, in development phase, it really depends. My souls usually have. Like when we were building an MVP, we split it into a couple of milestones that we should achieve. And in the launch phase, we have, I don't know, like a beta test is a milestone, a completely product demo is a milestone, product launch is a milestone. Um, for the ongoing projects where we have a dedicated development teams, usually the client is the one who has, you know, targets that they want to achieve. And we have a team that will do everything that it's needed to do to, you know, um, achieve their goals so that's the case where they set the milestones in place so we're just here to do what we need to do to make it happen but yeah it really really depends on the type of service that we're doing and also the type of product that we're building or the project that we're going doing as well so yeah thanks what about okay yeah um, very similar to, to HTEC and, and Vega as well. Um, uh, Katarina mentioned that um, so most of, most of our projects are, are digital um, product creation projects and we usually follow the agile approach for these and we have this agile delivery model that has the various phases. So uh, in theory, after every phase, we would have a milestone or a deliverable that was agreed upon uh, with the client that would shape uh, the vision for the next phase and the work for the next phase. Um, but in general, we also have some projects where we don't have uh, specific milestones, like for example, our maintenance projects, they don't get planned in a milestone way. It's basically if something's burning in production, we're fixing it immediately. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, often clients come to us and say, we have a product release, let's say, for example, in my project now, it's it's in April. So that is the milestone that they have from a business side internally and market side. So we need to work off of that and define, let's say, a feature freeze uh, two months ahead or whatever it is to allow us to accommodate for any bug fixes, any uh, quality topics that need to be fixed before that market release so that we're ready. Uh, when it comes, obviously followed by a period of hyper care. So that is a client defined uh, milestone. Other than that, like as a, as a delivery lead or a PM, uh, we have milestones uh, every every sprint in terms of sprint deliverables, et cetera. But that is very internal. Mm, thanks. Uh, Dan, I, I know that your type of services are, are a bit different, but still, do you have kind of any type of, of breakdown of um, your work that you uh, negotiate initially, or is that something that's kind of managed as you go, or how do you do that? 
Beautiful long term engagement, of course. Yeah, actually, this is super interesting. And it goes to what you said recently, uh, previously. And uh, because, you know, I usually get hired as a freelancer in product companies, and they want you to be fully integrated as part of their product team and drive outcomes. But you're sort of, a, you know, a freelancer on the service program. So you're sort of in the between, uh, you know, a hard a rock and a hard place. And you have to figure out how to do that. And then I noticed if, you know, the, the, the teams are quite structured and they already have like a strategy that's determined and quite like clear sort of company processes, such as OKRs and things. Uh, and they don't want a lot of input. Those are more shorter term projects. And then I would come in and sort of do, do my senior PM role of, you know, maintaining a good atmosphere in the team and sort of delivering good things. Uh, but if if it's more unstructured, then we actually do need to you know drive the strategy and the vision of the product. Milestones are a bit fuzzy. These things are usually forming, uh, and you know all these company processes need to be set up like OKRs and, and stuff. Um, those are more fun projects, and they last longer usually, from what I've noticed. And uh, because then the senior management is also ready to talk about it and how can we adjust, and then we set milestones basically you know as needed whatever works the best for the current state of the product that we're in uh, i think a couple of them were already mentioned here um so yeah i think it depends on sort of on the, on the team you would join and on the senior like stage of the product uh but sort of as a consultant that's it's a hard it's you're been in between like a rock and a hard place uh because they do want an, an outcome and you cannot always clearly sort of translate them into into milestones so uh, if I just may interrupt and just add and uh, clarify a little bit, because I said that we never, never do outcome driven development. So we do, we, uh, we uh, talk about outcomes. We talk about business results. We really, we sometimes go even as far as really talking financials with our clients. What we don't do is uh, we don't link those outcomes to the payment milestones and we don't link them to uh, to to our revenue so we don't take financial risk uh, okay. for, for that reason we don't do revenue sharing because that would be okay if we take financial risk for the outcome we would it's not it's logical that we take we, that we do revenue sharing that we take uh, a part of the intellectual property etc we don't do that so so we cannot take a uh, financial risk yeah, I guess it's similar on, the, on this side, especially if you're like sort of not not know what you're going to build yet. You need to run the discovery process and figure it out, or you need to run a bunch of A/B tests, and you know maybe half of them are going to fail, or you actually do a little product launch and it fails. Uh, it will be very hard if we're financially like it's it's also important that in the company at the atmosphere at the client side, the atmosphere is such that it's okay sort of to you know make a mistake and well educated mistake and learn from it. Um, I, I, um, as Igor mentioned, it depends on from client to client and contract to contract. Yeah, thanks. So we have a couple of questions coming from uh, our participants. So Branislav asks, which are the main tools that you are using as product project managers in your daily work? Uh, he's referring to digital tools, so Jira, Confluence. Who wants to take this one? I can go. I mean, definitely Atlassian tools, uh, but also just basic Microsoft. So, you know, Teams channels, uh, task planners, Excel, all of that, but also Miro board, very useful for requirements engineering, just to put all the <laughs> idea creation uh, from, from all the participants uh, on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mira and Mural actually side effects of Corona time. Um, <laughs> but uh, recently I started using, for instance, Azure DevOps tool because I'm on two Azure uh, cloud projects at the moment. So it's convenient also for, for project uh, managers as well and avoiding having two uh, tools, one tool for, for us, one tool for developers. Okay. Does anybody else use something different? Well, my recent role is Excel and PowerPoint, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, for I mean, managing projects, good for you. Yeah, but, you can show yeah, that one. <laughs> I'm not involved in delivery, actively at least. Uh, but uh, what our pro product managers are using, I'm going to focus on product managers because I guess it's 
more important than project managers, at least for this conversation. Uh, definitely Miro. We are also using, we are actually as a, as a HTC are trying to move uh, towards FigJam for, for, uh, uh, for diagrams. Uh, we use Figma, of course, for, for wireframing. Uh, for road mapping, we are dabbling with some tools. I know that some of, some of my teams are trying, uh, trying a product board. I talked to the, the development development team in San Francisco that are doing product board and they, they got me interested. So, so we are trying product board basically, but I know some, some other people are, are using a roadmap, aha. But, uh, even uh, I think some tried using uh, Atlassian, uh, how do they call it? Discovery, uh, Jira Discovery, something like that. This, uh, it was in beta some months ago. So it's basically similar to product, uh, product, uh, product board, but uh, yeah, just in Jira stack. It's it, what we try to do is to have as, as many things as possible integrated. So what's good for Confluence, Confluence it's integrated with Figma, uh, Product Board is integrated with Azure DevOps, it's integrated with uh, with uh, with Jira. So so we don't do things twice. We were we were using, for example, for road mapping Figma, and it's hmm. it's a really messy when you're done with the discovery and you're talking about staffing and whether the team is going to be 10 people or 20 people you need to send, provide a lot of roadmaps and if you have to draw, draw every single thing every time it can get really messy so for that that case it's, it's really good to have everything integrated oh yeah Branson, have we answered your questions do you have something else and feel free to unmute if you want to join us. I would maybe add also, I saw a lot of startups using Notion uh, these days. So moving a lot of the agile stuff in there and also like note taking and also all this internal communication across company that needs to be sort of uh, well ad adapted. Uh, but I'm, I'm sort of a Confluence fan myself. So I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I've seen people use Notion as well. Uh, the most interesting that we had was uh, we were talking with one client about uh, chat channel. Well, like we are using Teams, but, but we can use Slack. It's only, yeah, but we are using Telegram. <laughs> yeah, that team of uh, 18 people or something are using Telegram. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Why Those are fun. <laughs> okay, thanks. So we have another question. Sara is asking, do you think that AI can influence the models of digital product development service and in which way? Who wants to take this one? Well, we don't know yet, right? That's the fun thing. <laughs> yeah, it's an opinion. I'm sure you have one. <laughs> I see a lot of startups popping up, like trying to sort of concentrate on the, on the initial stages of like product discovery and user interviews. So sort of automatically transcribing user interviews, getting insights out of there. Um, so I think a lot of interesting things are happening, though I don't think I don't think PMs are going to be sort of uh, you know changed by that. It's going to be very hard. Um, yeah. Somebody else. Yeah, AI doesn't have a human uh, note, and um, I, I I had one colleague who said recently um, he's very popular on, on LinkedIn, um, and he said recently that as long as our clients do not know what they want and what their vision is, AI cannot support them, not even ChatGPT. So I would say no, <laughs> not at this time. <laughs> Sarah, do you have any additional questions on this? I can provide some. Yeah, go ahead. Ideas. We tried a little, try some 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 things with ChatGPT when it started. It's very good for well writing user stories, I guess, uh, especially when developers want more details. But on the other side, uh, ChatGPT intellectual property risk is very high. So so we are not using it anymore. We just tried it initially. Now it's uh, basically banned. Uh, what I think will be useful, I'm not sure if any any uh, products are in production 
yet. I think Microsoft uh, recently and they they published a bill. What's the name of the? Oh, of the yeah. Uh, no, no, not for the for 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 being, but for uh, the entire suite that that can leverage your existing document management system and that get that input data that's not fed into the into the into the loop of. Uh, so it's the main Microsoft one, right? That makes like summaries and presentations and helps you with your workflows, sort of. Is, is that what you mean? The executive assistant sort of that's embedded in? Yes, in yes, yes. So something like that. It basically can, can the entire thing. Yeah, sorry. I know this one <laughs> firsthand. So yeah, Copilot is uh, currently yeah. in Bing, but it's going to be integrated with everything else. And it's going to be, as Dan said, sort of executive assistant to you, to you and it's going to go across all Microsoft products. Yeah. But, it, but Anna, here's some feedback for, for the branding team, right? GitHub, Copilot and Copilot, it's a bit you know, confusing. Us. <laughs> it's not yeah. mine, but okay. <laughs> I'll pass it along. <laughs> yeah, but basically, basic what what uh, what can happen is uh, if you do interviews with users, you can transcribe those interviews, and if you do a lot of interviews as a product manager should do, uh, you get a lot of transcribed information that you need a lot of time to sift through. So basically, what uh, what can what you can do with AI is pattern matching and trying and uh, leveraging AI to figure out all the information base that you figured and that and even discover some patterns that you didn't think existing because the difference between uh junior and senior product managers is basically pattern matching that you can figure out some 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 similarities even if they're not clearly visible ai can help with that i'm not sure if there are any anything production ready for that but I, in my opinion, that's that's where the, the, the at least in product space where where the AI will go. Yeah. The engineers might complain if we use ChatGPT for writing user stories and uh, you know for transcribing interviews, they're gonna start asking what do you guys do, you know, the whole day. That's an easy one. You just leave them without your assistance. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, so Dragon has a, a interesting comment here. Dragon, do you wanna uh, maybe unmute yourself and join us? Is uh, he yeah, has for shared, sure. yeah, maybe just share what you've written here. Uh, yeah, I would love to uh, give more info about this. So one of my colleague uh, colleagues is uh, working based from San Francisco, and he connected me with one of his friends from from college over there. Who has just left his own company and you know that he was working for for like five six years he was a pm there uh and they co-founded a startup so he, he showed me just a bit of it he wanted some input whether i find this useful or not uh and basically what they are doing uh they they pitched this to his company that he just departed and they accepted to be like a pilot project so they integrated the tool they built into their chat and they are also giving them extracts of some emails and stuff. And they are using basically chat GPT to digest all of this and write out like suggestions. For example, a customer is writing with a sales rep and is asking for some features maybe they, that they don't have. And it's identifying that and it's giving it extracting as, as a list of like suggested features. So this is just the beta. So, you know, it's not really working fully, but it was interesting to me in terms of being something that can be helpful for our work, not, you know, yeah, sort of be dangerous for us and potentially replace us, but rather make some stuff easier for us, you know, because sometimes you are getting a lot of traction to different channels and it's hard to catch the right stuff all the time. Yeah, so if I understood you correctly, it's actually recognizing the patterns in feedback coming from customers and kind of providing the insights to the product managers, right? Yes, basically that's that's it's that's excellent. in essence. Sometimes like they are planning to do it like scanning of review websites and then extracting from that. Or also, you know, doing like uh, monitoring of live communication uh, of support reps, sales reps. This is something that we as a PMs not necessarily always even hear because we are not on the first line of communication uh, all the time with the end users. And sometimes th things get lost in translation. And, you know, 
we lose good opportunities to to uh, make our products better. So so I like the idea. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing if that startup succeeds or some other startup that, that use similar tools that, that offer something like that. Mm, I'm sure Product Board is working on that as well. <laughs> Igor is going to tell us once they release it. <laughs> but what's the name of this company? Uh, I don't know the exact name. It's a stealth startup yet. So they, he didn't disclose the name, actually. It's a good question. I haven't even asked him. <laughs> Yeah, because it's it's very very interesting. I mean, that that's basically what I was talking about. Get get generating insights from transcribed information, and you don't need transcribed information if you have a recording of uh, of of a conversation. Yeah, but I also definitely uh, think it supports um, in in the requirements engineering process. Uh, you know, especially if you're, for example, you have these proxy PO product owner roles where you have to get up to speed with the product, uh, with the industry very fast. And it really helps with that uh, learning curve uh, to to speed it up because you can get the information in, uh, in a matter of minutes at your fingertips, especially if it's like domain knowledge that you wouldn't have come across uh, usually in your other you know, like standard digital products. So maybe to kind of summarize, Sarah, for your question, uh, it's definitely going to help, but it's just a tool like any other. So if we know how to use it, it's going to be useful. If not, then it's not going to be useful for us, right? Okay. I want to see what our team in Microsoft is doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so maybe to take uh, another question, we have Danko asking, uh, maybe I missed you mentioned, but you all said that you're using Agile way of development. So my question would be what frame, frameworks you're, you use? I am unmuted already. Um, yeah, um, definitely Scrum. Um, Kanban as a framework, safe, scaled Agile. Um, framework as well. XP, not so much since I joined Tulke. I've never used it. I used it before. And mixture of everything, I would say. Hybrid, that's the, the nowadays the, the, the most popular way of working. A little bit of this, a little bit of that to please the clients and to try to, let's say, incorporate as well into their ways of working and development if they have one if not if they're pure product company um, probably um, um, hardware product company and then they engage with us to do a software part then we need to balance also with them because they're usually using waterfall because they have a strict milestones they have a strict production lines you know how it goes and then we need to really embed our scrum or kanban into their um uh, there's ways of, of product development. Yeah, thanks. Somebody else, do you use something different for any type of specific project, products? Yeah, we typically, okay. we start ahead, with, yeah, thanks. We're, we start with, uh, with Scrum, with some e easier timeline, less timeline intensive, more timeline intensive, we start with Kanban and as, as time progresses, we customize. That's that's my experience on, on, on multitude of, of, of accounts. Uh, because everything you need to adapt to the client, you need to adapt to the to our process, you need to adapt to release process, you very, very specifics. We never did safe per se as a as age tech, but we did participate in safe. Uh, we did, I'm not sure if we did extreme programming. I don't know that. Uh, we are trying, we're dabbling with, uh, with dual track. This is, the, that's one very interesting for, for product managers. Uh, for me, one big m milestone regarding dual track is that a product manager can get sick or go to vacation without uh, a panic mode in, in, in the delivery team. Uh, another is, of course, that, that uh, things are actually tested and that the experiments happen. Uh, but yeah, dual track, I think, is the the, the, the thing that we are uh, iterating on now and trying to to to, to figure the figure out the way that dual track would work for us 
but would also make sense for the customers because uh, typically customer they don't understand what it is uh, and they're with our client vendor relationship no matter how how close partnership is you always have silos you need you always have silos and dual track is one way to break those silos so that's that's what we are dabbling and trying to to, to, to improve thanks nicolina you were going to say something yeah but you were already mentioned a bunch of it so i can only add that uh, at vega we also do uh, nexus less and less huge uh, we typically don't do safe uh, and we have one client who is currently switching to extreme programming but pretty much yeah it's scrum and kanban on the most used or scrumban or whatever hybrid model that we should utilize for that project mm. I just wanted to ask, what, what do you mean by dual track? Is it like, do you mean uh, sort of the design and engineering are working in two separate tracks, so they, they're working together? Is that what you mean? Or Yeah, you, you basically have some sort of uh, discovery team that is closer to the client, closer to the user, and they iterate on ideas until the ideas are ready for production. So basically, you, you, you they risk the, the idea to, to, to so, so you don't waste time developing something that nobody needs. Oh, sure, cool. Yeah, that's what we talked about. It. Basically, that's that's that that's the core concept, and we're trying to adapt it for for our way of working. Yeah, maybe my mm -hmm. two cents on this topic also depends on the team experience. So, um, if the team is like super junior, they need more structure, and if they're more senior, they can do it. So, the best thing is like maybe to start with a really small team that's really senior. You can work in Kanban, or you can you know work in any sort of methodology you want. And then as you start hiring more junior employees, they usually need more structure. And then when the overall structure exists, then you transition to dual track uh, or, or something along those lines. Thanks. Danko, do you have any additional questions on this? Uh, thank you. I don't have an additional uh, questions on this, but maybe I, I should could ask one uh, more technical thing. Also, yeah. what wireframing tools you are using and why? Yeah, I think Igor mentioned uh, Figma. Uh, yeah, same here. We just, on a project, switched from Adobe XD to Figma for multiple reasons, but main being the, the collaboration uh, aspect of it. It's much easier in Figma. Also the Fig Jam for, for you know, doing um, designs there is, is easy to integrate and move, copy-paste. Thanks. Yeah, Nicolina. Yeah, I mean Figma, Figma and Miro. Miro, Miro boards can go berserk. Uh, we had some really like crazy Miro boards um, at eBay. So um depends what you're wireframing, right? But like usually Figma or Miro. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same in Vega. Figma and Miro or Miro, however you want to call it. Those are typical tools that we use. Sometimes Adobe XD, but rarely Adobe, mostly Miro and Figma or mm -hmm. Figma Jam. Thanks. From what I can see in our chat, we don't have any additional questions. We just have a comment from Dragan Danko on, on your question. Uh, he says we use Sketch plus Marvel, uh, which are integrated, but our UX team is entertaining the possibility to move to Figma. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, Dunya is saying in Vision and Zeppelin sometimes as well. Yeah, cool. Uh, I'm gonna kind of shoot another one of my questions just to give an opportunity for our participants to write uh, any additional questions in the chat. So we've talked about kind of really different uh, types of um, business models and services and different clients and so on and so on uh, but what i'm what i'd like us to kind of uh gather and summarize uh all of that through is what is the difference between a, a service of software development and a service of uh, product development is there a difference uh of uh sort of project versus product based service so who wants to go first i i can go yeah 
I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, with anyone. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> um, service of the project development or development of a project is for us actually. And in a context of clients and service models we discussed about today, we offer simply said there is no ownership over the product when selling a, a service for a project a delivery. And this is more similar to a question like, what's the difference between product and project manager, right? So um, as we know, and as Nicolina said, project manager is also responsible for the overall strategy, for the vision, for the success of a product. But project manager or delivery lead here is definitely responsible for planning, execution um, uh, of a project from, let's say, start to an end, but never of the product and success of the product in a way, okay, what happens after, after product is live? Uh, but we share the vision with the client and definitely their success is our success or their failure will be consequentially our failure because we work together. Um, but I'm not sure. I, okay, I, I've learned also today a lot of things from you guys, but I'm not sure if here in these regions um, and here in the service IT companies we have, even though we are kind of having a product companies or, or a daughter companies here in, in, in Serbia, I don't know if we have a full ownership over the product yet. This is just, um, I, okay, maybe um, in, in Vega or maybe in uh, HTAC, but um, when I'm talking with my colleagues from other companies, I don't see it. It's always someone on the headquarters side. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Also in our inner startup ecosystem, there's only so much product opportunities. And you know, we always talked about how outsourcing is not really helping the, the Serbian mm -hmm. IT scene. If I need to summarize, what's the difference between the difference between the project uh, development and product development? It's the rates. Uh, you can charge more. You can charge more as a product uh, ownership. And I think we as a community, we need to prove that, you know, hey, you know, I think it's a good to step in to sort of learn how to work with teams and how to execute projects, et cetera. Uh, get your sort of foot in but i think the next step is sort of to persuade uh, you know our western uh, uh, colleagues that we can do as good if not better of a job um and really like have ownership right and we were mentioning outcomes a couple of times i'm not sure how outcomes in service business is so, is super well uh, sort of connected it's to be figured out but i think the more we push in that direction um, the better it is for like our startup ecosystem, but also the, for the rates we can charge. Because I'm sort of, I'm a little bit of, of, of like, you know, it's 2023, like Eastern Europe is a cheap destination for software and, and project development. Yes, it still holds true. And it's good to, again, like kickstart your career. Uh, but I think the real fun, it's also more fun to actually have the full ownership and see how the product works and sort of to identify with it, et cetera. Um, I don't know if Dunya wanted maybe to add something different to what I said. <laughs> I put um, a personal touch in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, definitely, like, if I think about the projects that we do and then the product project that we do, project, for example, would be a typical consulting project, like, so, let's say, the digital strategy for the next five years. You know, it has a start and end date. Our team goes in there for, for two weeks up to a month and delivers the strategy to the client on what they're supposed to do. But then our product projects usually entail staffing of different roles, uh, usually proxy POs, delivery leads, things like that like roles like this that then would follow the the product uh, life cycle throughout sometimes all the way to maintenance so product is something that is living breathing after after the project is completed we might have a maintenance project for the product to keep it running basically i think the question is really big one <laughs> uh, why uh, it's because uh, the biggest question is what is the ownership of, of, of a product so if we are doing road delivery this is not just delivery of a product even if we are a product company so who is the person and who where do we get money from if we are investing our own money into our own product, then we have the ownership. If we are investing somebody else's money, then typically they, they have the ownership, even if those owners are VCs or whatever. So uh, 
when we look at what we are doing as as HTEC, we don't we don't have inte intellectual property of of any code that we write. That is very important for us because that that helps us solve a lot of legal questions. So if we have if we do have a, in, an intellectual property over something that we do, then it would make that that would mean that that we are building products as products but what that also means it also means that, that we need to invest into sales channels into marketing channels into hiring some very very supporting staff that is not not the same as selling services selling services is an enter, entirely different business model which is not often compatible with product the product basically product based business model and I know that some some companies, uh, that usually smaller companies, are trying to. If they have people on a bench, they they uh, use them to build the product. Or if you are a product-based company from Serbia and, and you you you're not really managing to sell your product, you're using part of capacity to earn money from uh, from uh, uh, from outsourcing. That's very diff difficult. It's very difficult to sell. If you are an owner of, of that company, you're trying to sell a product, but you're also trying to sell a service. That's very, very hard to sell. Well, uh, and, what I see from, from sort of trying to find new clients, I usually, it, so it happened in my career, I usually worked on the product growth side of things. So I worked very closely with sales and marketing and sort of optimizing their processes and seeing how they interact within the product. So now when I look for new freelance product opportunities, I would talk about product led growth and how actually if, you know, if we were to work together, we can, you know, we can sit down and figure out together how we can increase revenue through your marketing channels, through your sales processes, do a whole review, uh, maybe do a review of UX flows, find some like obvious conversion optimization metrics. And for the, in, and then, then you sort of, you know, we're going back to that outcome, outcome based sort of project delivery or product delivery. It's like when I talk like that with clients, they're more interested sort of to work together, but also to pay the rates that are sort of like, hey, we don't really care if we can pay you like a German rate, as long as like a revenue rises, who cares, you know, even better, you know? So it's sort of, it's not, it's not, you know, the, the, I feel there's not as much competition and as much um, expertise in that sort of area, sort of like beginning of the uh, of the discovery process and then like growth led product, um, yeah, development. Um, and in those kind of areas, you can sort of, yeah, come in and, and charge these higher rates and also like, have this product ownership. Yes, like but everything else is a sort of right. Uh, how how will you how will you match it? And and you know, in in all honesty, that's probably the most fun part of product management as well. Uh, we're seeing how you can impact revenue and uh, you know um, do something good for the team. So I don't yeah, know, but you're talking about see. rates. You're not talking about revenue sharing. And if you if you are a product company, it means you get revenue, not you you don't get rates. I mean, unless unless I own equity, I guess all these revenue sharing agreements are a bit. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they they don't don't happen. <laughs> they just don't happen. But that's actually a, a good point. So maybe then is your are your rates related to the revenue growth, maybe, or incentives I'm, related to the revenue growth? I, I'm, I did not have a project like that until now, but I, I can imagine how it could be fun, though, as Igor mentioned before, painful as well. Uh, so usually it was a flat out rate. I think we played with the idea, but we're not at that stage. It would be cool to have actually that much like potential to take stakes in the companies we do work with some early stage startups so it will be great to, to, to like not charge them a fee and just take a certain percentage but then you then we're going to start talking about like a startup venture studios etc cetera, etc cetera. what does that mean about the business model there um but that's a different topic probably yeah something to think about right <laughs> uh we have a question from danko that is related to this uh, topic so what is easier and better for companies based or located in serbia uh, to get a whole product for development and delivery or just give software development service? Whatever you can get. <laughs> I mean, in all honesty. Yeah, but what, it's e what is easier and better? Kind of what, what is your point of view on that? Augmented team is easiest. Yeah. Uh, full product development is definitely the hardest. But also because it's the hardest, it's the hardest to, to, to do. So those who do it 
they get uh, they can charge high rate like Dan mentioned before. So yeah, that's that's the best. That's that's what you're striving for. Mm. Where you end up, that depends on on the quality of your team, availability, and uh, what the customer needs. Maybe they don't need full product development. Anybody else wants to go ahead? Dave, for no, definitely, I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but also a lot of companies are transforming to the product-led mindset now. And um, yeah, you can charge more there. You can get bigger share there. So yeah, it's harder, but you earn more money. Yeah, usually clients have quite a strong vision on the product. Like they don't know all the details, etc. cetera, but they, they have a vision on, on the product. And then when they look for someone uh, in Serbia, it's usually to to do the software development service. Mm-hmm. Danko, any additional questions around this? I'm not no, at the moment. Okay. Okay, so let me just check. Are there any questions that we haven't answered or that you forgot to ask? This is the chance. No? Okay, then. Then we're kind of coming to the natural end of of this discussion. I think we covered more or less everything uh, that we planned, and we kind of have uh, a summary of the whole uh, conversation. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this uh, talk, and yeah, I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.